Um, yeah, so this is Kent's Magnificent Moths, and it's a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund that is led by Butterfly Conservation. It's fully up and running now, and it's running for a few more years until March 2024. This is the largest conservation project for a specific region and it really shines a spotlight on like the UK's rare moths. Rebecca's doing a really great job of coordinating management for the eight priority moth species that you can see on the screen. We will go into more detail about them later. She's really doing this on a landscape level um, with big partners and farms and stuff whilst I'm working as the engagement officer raising awareness within local communities of just really how special it is to be supporting these rare moths and that you know they can be found on your doorstep. Two of these are exclusively res resident in Kent with the other five only being found in Kent and one other county. So if we can skip, thank you. So recording moths has long been associated with like, the traditional moth traps that are left out in people's gardens overnight. And asking people in these community groups that I've started working with what they know about moths, one of the first things they'll say is, you know, they fly at night. That kind of thing would be the first thing. And we have hundreds of moths in the UK that exclusively fly during the day. And we've got even more moths that can be easily recorded during the day as they can get disturbed from where they're resting and they flutter a short distance before they reposition themselves so they're really easy to spot. So out of the eight priority moth species that we're kind of really focusing on we can survey seven of these during the day and some of them are actually only on sunny days so it makes for some really nice walks around Kent. So next slide so why is butterfly conservation's Moth project happening in Kent. Well, you can see that this is a map that shows where the moth species that are considered the rarest in the UK were distributed when potential locations were being considered. You can see there's a few hot spots. They are all found in the south. So obviously the more red it is, the kind of more dense those populations are. But what really sets Kent apart from many, well, every other kind of county is that for many of the rare moths that are found here, their entire UK population is restricted to Kent, whereas the species clustered in other hot spots like Hampshire do have scattered populations elsewhere. So the south of England is a northern climatic limit for many of these species that spread here from Europe. And with Kent's proximity to the continent and the wide range of habitats really, um, many species that have been declining across their former ranges kind of been retaining a foothold in Kent and then some of the moths that have colonised the UK from the continent have reached Kent first and they've not actually spread further in the UK. So a few of these moths have kind of done the opposite um, of this trend now, such as the brightly coloured Jersey tiger moth that you can now see, that is now both a migrant and a resident in Kent. And you may have noticed the caterpillars of the toad flax brocade moth in your gardens, as they have only just become breeding more widely across Kent in kind of the last decade or so. So their past preferences were of the common toad flax, which is found on shingle. They have now shifted to accept the purple toad flax that is quite often found in people's gardens. So the, uh, the toad flax brocades are no longer considered a species of conservation concern, but other moth species unfortunately still are. So Kent holds the entire UK population for two of our priority species, the black veined moth at the top and the fiery clearwing. For three more of our moths, the Sussex emerald, the bright wave and the straw bell, they are also very restricted in their distribution as Kent is their stronghold outside of Kent. Each of these moths can only really be found on one site. The next two are only found in one other county apart from Kent in the UK. So the marshmallow moth is just living just across the border into East Sussex. And then the Fisher's estuarine is only being found along the Kent, um, the Essex coastline, sorry. It is in decline in other European populations as well. 
making it the only UK breeding moth to have additional protection of European protected species status. And then the last moth in our eight priority species is a little very small micro moth called white spotted sable, which gets seen in a few other counties, but it's severely unrecorded. It's not helped by its day flying and it's really, really small size, about the size of your thumbnail. So throughout kind of our project, we'll be encouraging um, surveying for these priority moths. The kind of we need to be getting more people recording them to improve our understanding of where they found, where they, you know, if they're moving on to other food plants so that we can target conservation advice and management to the sites where it is most needed. So finding out that there are over 2,500 moth species in the UK can be a bit intimidating to hear for people if you're just considering whether to start getting into moth recording. So starting by getting familiar with some of our day flying moths is a great entry point if you want to learn a few species that can be seen during your daytime walks anyway but aren't necessarily ready to have your own garden moth trap and identify everything in it. I'm sure you already know from things like the big butterfly counts of a citizen science schemes, a few moths have been sneaking into the count in recent years. And day flying moths can be bright, colourful and common like the burnet moths. But butterfly conservation consistently receives fewer sightings of these moths compared to the butterflies. A lot of people are still just quite unfamiliar with them. But last year, we held the first Big Moth Safari, which was a week of engaging the public with moths, introducing them to some of our commonly seen day flying and night flying species, as well as explaining how to make your own moth trap and which plants would attract moths to your garden. So look out for the return of the Big Moth Safari across our social media channels and website which will be held during the last week of June this year from the 20th to the 27th of June. So for half of our project species, sunny daytime walks are the recommended way to survey for the adult moths. They live in very specific areas of Kent and their numbers peak for just a few weeks of the year. So if you have a free day to visit their habitat during their peak flight period, the chances of finding them are very good if you visit their known sites. There is potential to record these moths on your field days when finding these moths wasn't the intended purpose of your visit though. The white spotted sables can be seen flying alongside heath fritillaries in Bleanwoods and Duke of Burgundies in Dengewood. And straw bells can be found alongside the warp biter crickets at Lydon Temple Yule, as they have very similar habitat preferences to them. So starting with Anania funebris, commonly known as the white spotted sable, our project's priority micro moth that flies exclusively during the day. Now this moth has quite a distinctive appearance, being black with white spots and having these bright orange hair tufts. But we don't receive many records of this moth from areas apart from Bonsai Bank in Dengewood though. They're probably overlooked in most places, as despite their unmistakable appearance when seen close up, they are around the same size as an adult's fingernail. They also have the frustrating habit of flying in a spinning motion to the ground and disappearing amongst vegetation as soon as they're disturbed. But records have been received within the past five years from across the Bleen Woods complex, as the adults do fly around the same time of year as heath fritillaries, so they can be encountered, especially in sunny glades and rides where goldenrod grows and Cook's Glade within RSPB's Churchwoods is specifically where a lot of the records have come from in recent years. Their distribution is thought to be restricted by the abundance of their food plant, which is goldenrod. This is the native goldenrod, not the big bushy Canadian goldenrod used as an ornamental in people's gardens. 
and going against the stereotype for woodland wildflowers, goldenrod chooses to flower in late summer and early autumn and unfortunately is in decline in woodlands as they become too shaded, which then has a knock-on effect on many species, including over 40 moths that feed on goldenrod in the UK, one of which called the cudweed has already gone extinct. But these woods were surveyed for goldenrod this summer, so if you are interested in helping with the search for these moths in spring, we can share these locations of the denser goldenrod patches with you, which will allow everyone's searches for the adult moth to be very targeted to these areas. And we're hopeful that we will discover they are more widespread than our current distribution map would lead us to believe. So the next moth to start flying in the year is the black veined moth. This moth could previously be found in other counties in England, but now it only remains on chalk grassland within the Kent Downs landscape, specifically in the Wye and Crumdale area where farmers and other land managers are specifically guided by Natural England in how to create and conserve the suitable habitat for this moth. Now it's not as specialised with its habitat requirements when it's found on mainland Europe. So we think that the British population that's now only found in this area of Kent is considered distinct and critically endangered, making it the rarest of the project's eight priority species as it's found in just 10 fields all in this area. Now, black vein moths require a mosaic of habitat, including shorter, more herb-rich areas of chalk grassland where their larval food plants grow, and longer tall grass tussocks where their eggs will be safe and their caterpillars can shelter. This habitat mosaic is best achieved through cattle grazing and scrub clearance over the winter months. But to inform the decision of how many cattle to put on each field and then how long they should graze there, we need people out surveying for the moths and noting how suitable the habitat is in June. These June surveys have also helped us discover that individuals are colonising arable reversion fields that are just starting to become suitable for the moth. And we will have guided days in June that you can join to find out specific sections within YNNR where we need more people recording these moths during their flight period. Okay, so the bright wave moths are adults from mid-June to early August, so they're kind of the next in the adult flight period of our priority moths. And most of the sites in Kent are being in the Sandwich area and there's a smaller population in the area of Stodmarsh as you can see from the map. So coastal development and invasive species are encroaching into these moths habitats quite significantly so suitable habitats for these moths are really decreasing at the moment but we can't contribute to the conservation of the sites we're not aware of and we believe that there are more breeding sites that remain like undiscovered so it would be really worthwhile looking out for these moths anywhere along the coast between Ramsgate and Kingsdown, along the coastlines, along coastline sites that are warm with free draining substrate like shingle, where you can find low growing plants in the clover family, such as kidney vetch and hop trefoil, which are their larval food plants. So the next one is the straw belt moth, and this is the last of our moths to emerge that you can survey during the day and they can be found from mid-July to early September. We can easily tell whether these moths that we find are male and female based on their antennae which is feathered only in the males and as you can see they look pretty cool. So most of the sites where they are found in Kent are in Folkestone Downs with a smaller and declining meta population in the Medway Downs area and then just one isolated site in Surrey. 
So butterfly conservation advises on suitable habit, uh, suitable grazing regimes for straw bell sites over the winter months, but it really needs the help of the volunteers to monitor these moths throughout the summer by just walking the sites for a set amount of time and noting how many you encounter. In years like 2001, when the August weather didn't really present us with many sunny surveying days, it was really a struggle to survey all their known sites even before we could start looking at some potential sites. So this moth could really do with some extra people out looking on those sunny days during August. Pretty easy to survey. Um, the only surveying equipment you really need is a long stick to brush the veget vegetation on either side of you to just help flush out these moths from the grass where they rest during the day. And then they'll just flutter off slightly and reposition further along. Um, so the country, the White Cliffs Countryside Partnership manage a lot of the straw bell sites. So we'll be holding days with them throughout August to kind of show you some of the best sites and to go through those survey methods. So like the black veined moth, it is a habitat mosaic with variable sward heights. So you've got abundant herbs and some bare patches of chalk and then some longer grasses available during the adult flight period that kind of make a good habitat for this moth for them to rest on and also lay their eggs on. So the straw bell moth are found in the hills of Focus and Down area, but only really on the south placing slopes due to their preference for warm microclimate. So with climate change, it is possible that they could spread to other slopes, not just the south facing ones in the pretty near future. So it is possible that if we can keep these other slopes kind of clear from most of the scrub and allow cattle grazing over the winter months, it does provide us with the best chance for these moths to disperse. So straw belt caterpillars are cryptically camouflaged. They really blend in with the dead grass stems, as you can see from this photo. So you're really not going to see one unless you are really looking for it. They're thought to use a variety of caterpillar food plants, hence it's like mosaic kind of need, you know, using wild parsnip, yarrow, fairy flax and wild thyme on sites where these are found, will be looking out for their caterpillars in June. So on the chalk grassland sites, there are many more species that are under recorded and could do the few people looking out for them if you are in those areas anyway. So a few species specific to chalk grasslands are the chalk carpet, the lace border, and my personal fave, Oncosiera semi-rubella, which is commonly known as the rhubarb and custard moth. So these moths all indicate you're, you're in a good quality chalk grassland habitat. And whilst you're on surveys for straw bells, it's very likely that you'll see these moths as well. So as you might have expected for a moth focused project though, there are some moths whose surveys involve autumn evenings and torchlight, but only two, the marshmallow moth and the fish's estuarine. There will be bigger publicly advertised survey evenings to offer you a rare opportunity to see these moths as they are both legally protected from disturbance and so require a license to survey them. To help us monitor more of the sites for these moths though, we'll be setting up small groups of people to join someone that has a license as more torches looking for these moths should provide us with a more accurate picture of how many moths each site is supporting. This moth may not be flashy to look at, but the entire UK population of the marshmallow moth numbered around 100 individuals seen last year across just a few breeding sites in Romney Marsh and a few along the River Medway. With only one individual found at several of their sites last year, they are just clinging on facing the decline of their food plant, which they need in large swathes to be able to survive. Monitoring is needed for each marshmallow moth site, both during a day in August to count the number of plants that have come up to inform whether any change in management is required, and at night in September with a torch looking for these moths themselves. Their strongest site is a farm near Rye, 
but here the moths are unfortunately facing additional pressures from the local spider population, another factor to be monitored and considered in our surveys. Their food plant is the marshmallow plant, which is a member of the mallow family that can be found in marshy areas and ditches. Um, it can be found in drier areas as well, but they can be outcompeted a bit by thistles and bristly ox tongue. So on lots of sites, they're just clinging along to the edges of the ditches and they support the marshmallow moth caterpillars which feed on the plant's roots, which is coincidentally the part of the plant that humans also fed on when we first developed the marshmallow sweets from the root of this plant. If people are interested in botanical surveys, we would like to hear about any area with at least 500 marshmallow plants growing densely near the moths populations in Romney Marsh as these could be breeding areas for this moth that we are currently unaware of. And if there are sites that don't have quite that number, but could become suitable with the addition of some more, then it would always be worth informing us about it, as we are working with community groups, volunteers and garden centres to grow hundreds of marshmallow plug plants to add to new and existing areas of habitat, to manage them specifically for the marshmallow moth, as supporting a population of this moth requires a dedicated area with hundreds of flowering spikes of marshmallow plants, so most gardens won't have the space for a large enough area to help this moth, but people can still get involved and help by growing on marshmallow seeds into small plants and coming to a planting day at one of our habitat creation sites next summer to add them in a location where the moth will be more likely to find them. There are also two times of year for serving the Fisher's estuarine moth and getting to know their caterpillar food plant, hog's fennel, is vital for being able to locate the moths. As you can see from this plant in the foreground, hog's fennel is hard to miss when mature being over a metre tall and wide. Their tall stems die off naturally in the autumn though, so areas with these plants don't need to be cut at all. And not cutting them allows the moths to complete their life cycle, as over the winter they will be eggs laid in surrounding grasses, and in the spring they tunnel into a nearby hog's fennel stem. You can see where they've been, by the thrust that they produce and push out of the stem as they tunnel through, eventually reaching the roots and creating a large thrust volcano at the plant's base. And we can visit the Fisher's estuarine moth sites during the day in the summer and we can know exactly how many hog's fennel plants are currently being occupied by these moths for looking for their frass volcanoes. Unfortunately, hog's fennel in itself is quite a rare plant. Um, looking at scenes like this at Tankerton Slopes, you may not believe me, but there are only four sites in Kent where it can be seen growing so extensively. Um, and the moth has only managed to find three sites in Kent with enough hog's fennel growing to support it at Tankerton, Long Rock and Cold Harbour Lagoon, um, which is just beyond Reculver. There is also extensive hog's fennel found along the creek just outside of Faversham, but the moth has never been seen there. So we think the distance between Faversham and Tankerton is a bit too far for the moth it's not known to fly very far at all. And it's likely that between Whitstable and Reculver in the other direction along the coast, is also a bit too far for them to disperse without suitable habitat in between. So if you know of any small areas of hogs fennel in Kent that we may not be aware of, you can let us know your sightings and we can speak to land managers about whether they can leave their areas uncut 
to allow these plants to grow and support the moths and encourage their dispersal. On sites like Tankerton slopes where over 90% of the hogs fennel plants are now occupied by the moths, we are recording more adults here during our torchlight surveys than at any other site in the UK. And as the site is close to reaching its carrying capacity of moths, we have identified nearby areas where hogs fennel plants grown from seeds collected last year can be planted out to link up existing populations along the coast, which has already been done successfully in Essex. These are impressively large moths when seen in person, and anyone who helps with the search for their plants and for their frost volcanoes can also join our torchlight surveys and be rewarded with a close-up view of the moth. They are helping out on our guided evening to see them in September. The adult life stage isn't always the best time to monitor every moth though. The Sussex Emerald mostly feeds on wild carrot and this is a much commoner plant than marshmallow or hog's fennel of course, but this moth's habitat is only enriched vegetated shingle which does restrict where we can create suitable habitat for it. Rabbit grazing has reduced wild carrot survival on some of its sites, including here at their long-term population stronghold by the Dungeness Power Station, where wild carrot now struggles to reach maturity and flower outside of specifically created rabbit fenced plots for the moth. Work began this or last autumn on creating a further suitable breeding area on shingle at Great Stone on Sea, where there was an obvious presence of rabbits. So we've cleared some enriched vegetated areas of scrub and sown wild carrot to encourage these moths to spread out from their traditional breeding areas and increase their population. As of this year, Rye Harbour Nature Reserve is one of only two places in the UK where both the Sussex Emerald and Marshmallow moths breed due to years of dedicated habitat creation efforts for them by the Sussex Wildlife Trust. For the Sussex Emerald this involved fencing off areas, sowing wild carrot seeds and removing encroaching bramble to provide an open but safe habitat, rabbit free, for the caterpillars to survive. As you can see, this fenced area is also where the Sussex Wildlife Trust were running a moth trap. So after a few years of noticing a rapidly increasing numbers of Sussex emerald moths appearing in the trap, a search for their caterpillars feeding on wild carrot was finally successful with two little green and red striped caterpillars found rewarding years of habitat management work done by dedicated people, patiently waiting for the moths to decide it had become suitable breeding habitat. And because Sussex Emerald adults can get blown on the breeze and turn up in unexpected places, it's only the finding of these caterpillars that proves they are using breeding habitat in an area. So we will be running training days in May where you can search for these rare caterpillars here and at other potential sites so we can see whether their populations are increasing. Okay, now on to one of our project's early successes, expanding our knowledge of this moth's habitat requirements. So there are a total of 11 clear wing moth species in Kent. These moths are day flying and they shed some of their wing scales within their first day as an adult. To achieve this look, mimicking the appearance of certain wasps and hornet species to avoid um, predators and offer themselves some protection. For this showy looking moth that relies on its appearance to hide within plain sight, we don't seem to knowingly come across them very often and we actually have very few records for any clear wing species being submitted each year and they are mostly from people who just seem to come across them on their walks, not often realising until later that they're actually looking at a moth. The fiery clear wing pictured here can only be found in Kent 
and the fiery colourings of their wing scales sets them apart from the other clear wing species, makes them easily identifiable. So this is a legally protected Schedule 5 species, so it is illegal to disturb them. For fiery clear wings, this means no use of pheromones, which can be brought for other clear wing species. Um, and for widespread species, these pheromones you know, have greatly increased our knowledge of where they can be found. But for fiery clear wings, using a pheromone law not only is illegal, but it does have the potential to lure males from quite far away, um, which doesn't always give us the confirmation that it's actually a suitable breeding habitat and that we are removing them from areas where females would naturally be. So according, according to the field guides, the fiery clear wing is restricted to sites in Kent with curled dock plants in a warm microclimate and on free drainage substrates. The substrate was thought to be really important in their distribution, according to the literature, as like other clear wings, the, they feed on the root um, of their larval food plants, so they cannot survive where docks are inundated with water over the winter or where docks would be cut before September, when there are still eggs on the dock stem or leaves. So this meant that until this year, only habitats like shingle at the top of beaches and a few brownfield sites and road verges were being searched to find these small black eggs. You can see just pictured there. The number of eggs being found at these sites were decreasing though, with some sites being lost altogether as the curled dock plants were removed out of cracks in the sea walls. Brown sites were developed with mitigation efforts failing and increasingly powerful winter storms produce these areas of shingle beaches where the dock plants could kind of just get washed away. So some coastal sites become less suitable for them and a few sightings of fiber clearing adults were increasingly being reported inland. We checked some of these sites and similar ones nearby. This included farms, tall grasslands on heavy clay and to our surprise, with the help of volunteers, we have found fiery clearing eggs at 13 new locations across north and south coast of Kent last year. So these were mostly on sites thought to be completely unsuitable for them. This really opens up opportunities for the people across Kent to look for fiery clearing eggs to help us track their populations as they spread inland to kind of unpredictable locations. Egg searches also provide the chance to legally see the adults, because if you're finding the eggs, the moth that laid them probably won't be too far away. In fact, last summer, there was a mating pair right next to the dock plant Rebecca was checking at one of the new sites this summer. So a site that is in need of active work to kind of maintain their population of fiery clearing is San Fojo. There's a shingle bank just on the right as you drive down into the site and every year curled dock plants are grown and planted out on this shingle bank for fiery clearings to use by the volunteers there. There are dock plants in other areas of the site but this is the only area where fiery clearing eggs have ever been found. So in the summer we'll be holding a big meet the moth day there for people to hopefully see fiery clearings and kind of learn how to recognise their eggs. Once you know what you're looking for Every dock plant you pass on a walk becomes a potential place to discover a new breeding site and it becomes quite addictive. Uh, Rebecca and I were checking every single plant we came across to just to see if they were there. So the docks growing next to this cone were chosen as a place where one female laid her eggs last year. And then one of our volunteers went home after one of our egg survey training days last summer, only to find that there were fiery clearing eggs laid on the dog plant that was in her front garden's meadow area, which we then carefully helped look after to ensure the dog plant on there was not disturbed, much to the amusement of all of her neighbours. So those were our eight priority moth species that the project is focusing on to engage more people with monitoring moths in Kent. And we don't have time to cover all of our other monitoring opportunities now, but if you're up for a challenge, we have more opportunities for different species around Kent, specifically to improve our knowledge of the ecology of rare species. 
This includes looking out for distinctive starwort moth caterpillars in September. These have only been found in Kent feeding on sea aster but in the books it says they also use goldenrod and after a few adults have been recorded near woodlands check some goldenrod and you might become the first person in Kent to discover that these moths have two caterpillar food plants that they can use here as well. And if you're already thinking of sites that could potentially be suitable for some of the moths we've talked about, you can check their distribution maps on the new Kent Moths website, which is kentmoths.org, which will provide Kent specific information about all of the species that we've mentioned. Okay, so if you would like to join some of our upcoming survey days or event days, um, you can kind of see what we've got coming up and there you can help learn how to monitor them. We'll put in all of these in more detail, meeting locations, times in our newsletter that kind of goes out once a month. And the email is just at the top of the page. That is my email there. And I can add you to that list to just kind of get um, upcoming events and opportunities that you might want to get involved in. And that is it. So yeah, I guess if people's got questions, ask away.